Matt Thompson, you are the co-creator of Archer, now the Emmy-winning program, Archer, and you're about to make the return to uh, your eighth season uh, coming up on FXX this year, and it's going to be, and it's called Archer Dreamland, and I was wondering what made you and Adam Reed, the other create, the other co-creator, uh, land on the era and feel for this Dreamland season? Awesome. Uh, it's great to talk to you. Uh, I... Um, I'm really excited for Archer Dreamland. Just real quick, first, Adam's the creator. I'm the executive, uh, one of the exec executive producer along with him, but he definitely is the creator. Um, this season, Archer Dreamland, huge, huge departure for us, um, where we take the entire season back to 1947 and do a film noir mystery as Archer searches for the... Uh, person or persons that murdered his partner, Woodhouse. It is a giant departure for us, but it's one that I'm super excited about and I'm really looking forward to for, for so, so many different reasons. But one of the main reasons is for everybody to experience the show as we, you know, as you know, all these characters and they've all slightly changed for this season, but they're all still slightly the same. Like, for example, Mallory's no longer Mallory. Her name is Mother, and she is a crime boss in 1947. Now, she's still the same Mallory Archer that we know and love, but like slight things have changed for her. For example, I think like um, the previous Mallory had to deal within the lines of the law a little bit, but now she's a mob boss, and she's just like, go kill him do it and so she's you know kind of the shackles are off of her a little bit as well as she has an interesting relationship with archer who is no longer her son but he is like this flat foot pi that she lords over in the same manner that she would lord herself over her son and so that's one of the things i'm most looking forward to people experiencing which is it's a show that where everything has changed about it but yet it hasn't changed it's just a new and different facet for these characters and these actors to be playing within that has made the whole thing very fresh and brand new for me. And, and that's and it's really interesting that you guys chose the noir concept because it the show has always had that sort of feel and I know that it's underneath you, it. Yeah. Yeah, and it, it, you've always played around with that also in that you know it's sort of just in its own era. It's not a specific time yeah. because, you know, it, it feels very, it, the old show felt very 60s, but you'd still see them use cell phones. Right. So you know, it was always very interesting to see that. Yeah. It, I think the, the film noir has been underneath this show uh, for a long time, like the tent poles of like mystery and go it alone, private eye, and the whole world's against you, but yet you somehow will succeed or fail. That has always been inside of the show uh, at, its, at, its, at its core. And I think it just really made a lot of sense for us to go back and do that. Now, if you go back and you watch a movie like The Maltese Falcon, which has a lot of influence on us this season, which is not only visually, but you know, in the original Maltese Falcon, you saw um, the Sam Spade character investigating the death of his, parcher, uh, of his partner, Archer. And in this season of Archer, Archer is investigating the death of his partner, Woodhouse. And to deal with that made a lot of sense for Adam, a lot of sense for the show, that symmetry. And to for us to really have a good way to talk about the death of George Coe, the, the actor that played Woodhouse, as well as what we wanted to do with this season just kind of clicked all into place. There's another aspect to it, which is our rule for a cartoon world has a lot of rules and like things take place that are supposed to not be flippant or uh, nonsensical, you know, like somebody just doesn't turn into, um, I, I don't know, like a, a truck and drive away, you know, they're a human being and they're human being rules. And so when Archer at the end of season seven, gets shot, he's lying in a pool. By all accounts, this character should be dead. And so we just didn't want to fade up on season eight and say, wow, wasn't that awful how I almost died, but now I'm miraculously better. And so to give that weight, we wanted him to wake up, not wake up, but to be in a coma to start season seven. And then the conversation was, um, okay, if he just wakes up immediately, how is that different? And so Adam just had a, just a, what I think is a genius idea, which was 
let's have the whole entire season take place inside of his mind while he's in a coma. It's as if the ending of St. Elsewhere was extended for an entire season. And uh, I, think it's, I think it's great. The look of the show this season is unlike anything we've ever done before. With the, with the special attention that we pay to lighting, the special attention we play to trying to make it really feel like a true film noir piece, it's, it's, I think that we've made something wholly different. I'm, I'm excited to see people see it. Yeah, and it also has those echoes of films like Double Indemnity or yes. even or even a, a film like Chinatown, which is in itself an ode. We looked at Chinatown. We an did. ode to film noir. Yep, we and definitely looked at Chinatown. Um, you know, and for a long time, the story was going to be about water rights. <laughs> and, um, but then it, it changed. It changed over time. But I believe Adam's original idea for the film noir was going to be about water rights and stuff. But that ended up proving to dominate things too much. And he uh, ditched it. But it's interesting that you said that because we definitely looked at uh, Chinatown. Not my two, not the two Jake's but at Chinatown. <laughs> yeah, the, Ro the Roman Polanski direction definitely yes. helps in that one. Um, uh, so what has been the most enjoyable part of using this framing device for the season? By far, uh, easy answer. Uh, the look on the actors' faces, when you hand them a character that they've been doing for seven seasons and now they get to do things slightly differently. Um, just as I've gotten to know these actors over the years and, and just have enjoyed them all so much individually and collectively. And then their excitement for uh, Pam, for example, Amber Nash, she, her character, we don't know if she's a man or a woman this year. And the phrase that we constantly keep using is, why is it important that we gender identify her? And um, it's, it's, she's had a blast. She's had a blast like I wouldn't. I don't want to say reinventing the character because you're going to recognize the character of Pam, but it's not Pam. The character's name is Poovy. Poovy. And so she's Detective Poovy. And getting to play somebody who you've been playing for so long, and there's a there's a whole new different angle to it, has been um, very rewarding for our actors. Uh, I think, just as a practical standpoint, Lucky Yates, who plays Krieger, as you might imagine, when we go back to World War II and coming out of World War II in 1947, sure he's involved with the Nazis. And so there's an entire episode where he largely has to speak German for the entire episode. And what does that mean? Lucky doesn't speak German. Krieger might, Lucky doesn't. And so Lucky had, we recorded um, a German speaking um, actor reading all of his lines and Lucky just listened to that for two weeks until he was confident that he was ready to go to record his lines and do it, and, I, and he killed it. But all of them have something like that this year, which is their characters are different. They're getting to play a slightly different person, and it's been really, really rewarding. So on the flip side of that, I, I, what was the most challenging part of using this framing device? Uh, again, easy answer, and it was the burden placed upon Adam as he's writing um, this storyline to not have cell phones. 1947, we want to stay true to it. And um, our show constantly takes the cast and they break apart for some reason and eventually they come back together for some reason. But they're off doing things here and then some are over there. And in 1947, when you do that, what you get is they're out of communication with each other. You can't just pick up a phone out in the middle of nowhere and say like, hey, come get me, I need a ride. And so Adam had to deal with that these people can't just communicate with each other. And the story doesn't get further along quickly on a dime when somebody just uh, picks up, gets the information they need, and then you know everything changes. And so their inability to communicate directly with one another in a quick fashion was a very much of a challenge. And I, I, the very first thing Adam said to me as he finished writing the final episode was, thank God, I can't wait to put a cell phone in somebody's hand. <laughs> oh, that's, <laughs> I love that. Um, so as you mentioned before, um, back in 2015, uh, George Coe, uh, the man who voiced uh, Woodhouse passed away. 
Um, uh, I feel like there's so much that uh, a lot of people probably don't know about him. He was an Oscar nominated uh, short uh, Saturday Night Live. Uh, yeah, and he was in the first season of Saturday Night Live. He di- he directed an Oscar nominated short film, which was a send up of Ing- uh, Ingmar Bergman films. Uh, you know, you know, I was just a- I was wondering if if there's anything you could tell us about uh, uh, George that is that just sort of best exemplified him. Um, uh, in in what he brought to uh, Archer, George was a very funny guy, and we know we knew that he had all of this history uh, experience. But we cast him because he was so great at accents and voiceover work. And after he was cast as Woodhouse, was when we went back and we went, "Holy cow!" We didn't know, uh, and he was very very humble about it. And he was never one to say, um, "This is." you know, how it should be done or whatever, because we just didn't realize that he had done all that stuff until we got to know him. And the thing that always was impressive to me about George was was how easily he slipped in, just as a, as a cartoon producer, what matters to me is like how easily somebody slips in and out of unrecognizable voices, where you are constantly doing something and then something comes out of your body and you're like, what? Um, and you can't understand how this man, all these different sounds came out of him. And it was always very, very impressive to watch uh, him do that. Um, I didn't have a lot of experience with, you know, all the times that he spent on some of these famous movies and and TV shows. And so every once in a while you would ask him for a story about that. And he was always kind of like, ah, well, you know, and he just, he was just humble. And he didn't um, ever try to dominate the conversation in that manner. It's a really, really wonderful, fascinating guy. I think the last episode we recorded, we talked to Jeffrey Tambor. Jeffrey Tambor's in this entire entire season back as uh, Len Trexler, who's kind of a foil to to, to mob boss uh, Mallory Archer. And um, Jeffrey knew him a little bit too, and I didn't know Jeffrey knew him until uh, this this final recording we did with Jeffrey. And he thought, had had super high opinions of him as well. And um, Without even thinking about it, Jeffrey's like, uh, you know, so let's, as we're getting ready to read his episode, he was like, let's, let's dedicate this, my final episode to, uh, to George. And so we had a really kind of nice, quiet moment where right before we started recording Jeffrey's episode, he, we kind of dedicated it to George, which I didn't see coming that day. And it was kind of beautiful. That is that is really nice, and I'm and glad I think you brought it's it. Nice because Jeffrey's so nice. <laughs> I, that's a, that's a, one of the things that I've loved over the past two years is um, uh, getting to see Jeffrey. And that's what I wanted to ask you next. Actually, is what was it like having Jeffrey Tambor back as Len Trexler? Last time we saw him, I think he was saying, "For the love that of for the love of all that's green, take me and Rabber to the lettuce." Store, yes, which is one of my all time favorite lines. Yes, he's uh, he's a really great guy. It's been awesome having him him back. And um, I remember when I I I called him to say, "Hey, Adam is thinking about." bringing back Len Trexler for the entire season. I want to make sure it's been a couple of years since we spoke. I want to make sure it's okay. You know, would you do this? And I think the exact phrase I said to him was, can you put away all your awards and come do some fart jokes with us? <laughs> and he was like, in a minute. <laughs> and this is only Jeffrey could do it. And it's like, he was so excited, like almost childlike and just like immediately. And I was so it was so taken aback by his response. I there was no, like, well, let me think about it. Mm. It was so immediate and so great. And um, he has he has a lot of fun doing it. I think, and because it is slightly different, um, but uh, it's been a blast because we missed him. Uh, he's a really wonderful, great guy, and I love selfishly, uh, selfishly as an Arrested Belt fan, I love seeing. Jeffrey and Jessica go at it. Yeah, when when um uh the first time we see uh him as Trexler cuz he he also did um uh another character in the first season I I believe it was a UN guy, right? Uh who gets uh who they murder at Mallory's apartment, right? I'm not sure if that was him or not. Like I can't I got to be honest. It was like, him and he um I think he I think you're right. And we were just like, yeah. why won't we have him be around here always? <laughs> I think I it think was, he might be right. Yeah. 
Yes. It was like and Killing it was just, Unte, I believe is the name of that episode. Yes, say, yes, yes. And he was like around the dinner table. And I think that we just decided like, he should always be here now. <laughs> that was the thing. It was so great to see, especially in the character of Trexler and how you used Trexler and Mallory. Yeah. Just to see that dynamic again uh, between, the, between Jessica and Jeffrey. Uh, and then it just took on a whole new level, and he always seemed to be having fun with just how well he delivered those lines. Yeah. And he's great this season as well. He has a very unique style in his delivery that I really, really always enjoy. He just brings something different and unexpected um, that uh, I find very refreshing about everything that he does. So one other thing, uh, so another thing I wanted to ask you about, so... Uh, this is the eighth season of the show. If I'm remembering correctly, uh, the uh, you, uh, you and Adam are set to do two more seasons of the show, and then it's going to wrap after the tenth season. Is that correct? I don't know. Uh, it, it's possible. I try to think of how things is a every year basis. I know Adam has said that, and it's probable, but I I can't ever say anything for certain like even um what we're doing next season i'm not positive on what that's going to be i know we're not going back to dreamland that this is a one-time story but for me i'll try and wait a couple of months until after the season's over before coming down with anything definitively so it's probable but I can't even figure out what I'm going to have for lunch today. <laughs> so like to tell me what I'm going to be doing two and a half years from now is, is difficult for me to like come down with a definitive statement of like, yeah, this is what, this is what I'm saying. I will say that, that, that we've definitely discussed it and we are, there are plans that we have, but we constantly break plans. So I, I can't say that with a hundred percent certainty. Uh, but uh, you are signed on for another two seasons after this, correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, that there's, I mean, you've you've kept the show going this long, and it's still so great. Oh, thank you. So, I mean, I feel like the dumb and dumb and characters. So you're saying there's a chance. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I don't know. So I I just wanted to ask something a bit more in general about um how um. Uh, Adam looks at the characters. Has there ever been a point where you look at how Sterling is acting in a scene that Adam's written and you and or Adam uh, say to yourself that he's going too far in his self selfishness? Have you ever had that moment? I, I don't I don't think so. I will say that every once in a while while we are recording an episode and, and directing John, John will sometimes, John, H. John Benjamin, well, sometimes go like, you know, I don't think that sounds like Archer, and he'll slightly change it in 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 some way to make it more because, like, after all this time, John's become a very good arbiter of all things Sterling. If this makes sense, if this doesn't make sense, and so all the actors have become that way, where it's so second nature for them. I also think that for Adam, these characters live inside his head so much, so it's very rare that he makes a mistake with it because they all actually live there. They live inside of his head. And so he's constantly talking to them in, in some way. Some um, Adam's uh, girlfriend explained it to me one time really well, which is like, she believes that every single one of these main characters on Archer are just a different facet of his personality. And so that he's really just talking to himself for the entirety of this show, and so they're all true because they're all really a small sliver of him. I don't know if that part's true or not, but uh, it, it sounds good. <laughs> it does, but it also kind of makes me worry. What part of him is yeah, Krieger? Yeah, right? Yeah, what part of him is Krieger, and right. does his girlfriend need to worry because he also does voice Miss Gillette? So, um, kind of worried there, but, you know, whatever floats his boat is fine. Right, um, right. Because he does a great job with Ray, and I love... I love Ray I so do much. Too. He doesn't take um, stock in how good of a voiceover performer he is. Like me personally, I'm all over the show. It's like whenever there's a detective or somebody who has like under six lines, I'll just do them real quick. Um, but I know better than to do a main role because my acting is a little bit limited to like, hey, are you going to go over there or not? 
And but Adam's great at it, but he doesn't consider himself great at it. And that's why he's not in the opening credits. He's like, no, don't put me in the opening credits. Ray's not really main cast. They're the actors, you know. Uh, Chris Parnell and and, and and Aisha, they're the actors. Leave them up there. I don't want to be considered main cast because I'm just kind of jerking around. But I think he's really good at it. He is, and I mean, he also carried a show like Frisky Dingo. Also, yeah, yeah, like pretty much all himself. It, it was it was crazy. And yeah, then you also had was, Amber Nash there. <laughs> yeah, he was he was great. We put some effects on some of his voices to bring him out differently uh, <laughs> on Frisky on Frisky Dingo. Oh, there's there's Frisky Dingo. Hi, Frisky. Uh, but yeah, he's 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 solid solid do work for whatever that's worth. So uh, as I said at the beginning, now Archer uh, at this year's at last year's Emmys uh, won the Outstanding Animated Program category. Uh, I was thrilled. I know a lot of my friends were thrilled. A lot of people at this website were thrilled, including uh, one of our fellow editors, uh, Tony Ruiz, who's also Tony. a very big yeah, he's a very big fan well, of you, uh, Archer. And um, I was wondering, what was the mood like when you were going into the ceremony? Because they split it up into two nights, and you guys were on the second night this year, uh, yeah. this past ceremony. Um, we had been to the Emmys before and lost, and so uh, all of us were like, we're not going to win. So Because you don't want to... Getting your hopes up, like the first Emmys we went to and we didn't win, it was crushing because... We're like, hey, we're gonna, we're gonna win. We're gonna, yeah. Well, of course, of course we are. We're here. Why would we be here if we're not gonna win? And then when you don't, you're like, oh, god, damn, that hurt. And um, so, the year that we won, uh, we were like, oh, no, 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 we're not gonna win. And so when you did, it was like, whoa, and your mind's blown. And um, uh, all I could remember was this like tunnel vision that goes on that you try to just not fall down on the stairs because it's just like streaming light. Like you're going at light speed, you know, like Han and Chewie, you know, the lights are just going past you and you just have to stay inside of the stream. You know, don't get out of the warp hole and uh, don't trip on those stairs. And so that was just like became my focus, which is don't trip on stairs. Don't trip. And then, um, then you stand up there, and it's kind of like you're in a movie. You're outside of your body, um, and it's just crazy. So the whole entire cast, you're kind of like with them ever from when you win to for the rest of the night, and it's surreal. You're on like this emotional high. It feels like you're just like, this is great for about five hours. Like, okay, now what? <laughs> and um, you just have this really good feeling like uh, you can do no wrong. For, I should have robbed a bank like right then because I was like feeling invincible. Like bullets would have just bounced off me, you know. Those um, wind tips are sharp too. You could have yeah, been that. Those tips are sharp. And in fact, you know, and they, they, they make, they hand you the award and you fly home with it or go home with it. They don't just send you the award at some other date. And so like getting on a plane with it is like, all the things they don't let you on planes with today, and they're going to let me on the plane with this big heavy metal object that has two points where the wings are. And like, it'd be totally like, I am taking over this. Okay, I probably shouldn't say this. I'll probably be arrested in five seconds. But yeah, I was surprised that that was allowed on the, on the plane. But, you know, Emmy winner Matt Thompson takes over a plane <laughs> shot by TSA agents. That's what it'll <laughs> say in my obituary, I guess. So uh, I was so uh, w with that, you know, now that title added to you, how shocked were you and Adam that you won? And how long has it taken? Did it take to sink in? Has it sunk in yet? Uh, it, for about a month, it was awesome, which is like everybody's congratulating you. People who I haven't talked to in a super long time, people from college, from high school, um, will like contact you and say like, great, I didn't know you made cartoons, but that's awesome. And um, people will congratulate you and thank you. But then after the month is up, everybody's like, screw you. What, what are we doing? Where, where's my stuff? No one cares anymore. They cared really, really a lot for that one month. And now it's just like, now what? Um, so now I, I think I have to go win a, a Tony and an Oscar uh, for them to take me seriously again. <laughs> 
I have to get my, what is it, the EGOT? I got to get an EGOT. Yeah, I got to get the EGOT. Yep. Got to get that. Yeah, I think you could do it. I think uh, could do I'm going to have a lot of trouble uh, with that Tony. <laughs> I think well, the Grammy might be also a bit troubling. Grammy, too. I'm, I've got some spoken word. I'm ready to go. <laughs> oh, okay. I forgot about the spoken word categories. That's, how, that's, how, they, that's how they get you. I mean, hell, Hillary Clinton has a Grammy, so you know, right? Anything's possible. Yes. But like, uh, you know, what you were saying about the wingtips. Uh, several people have injured themselves. Are they really? They accept, the, probably the one that's most famous is Jeremy Piven. When he won his first Emmy, at the end of his speech, he kissed the trophy, but he aimed the wingtip at his face. He <gasps> actually cut himself on his, uh, on his face. Yeah. Oh, Artie. <laughs> All I could think of is Jeremy Piven saying, don't be that guy. <laughs> Cutting himself in the eye. What was that, well, PCU? Yeah. <laughs> well... Uh, Matt, I can't thank you enough. Uh, the new season is uh, premiering. Uh, when is it? It's on uh, uh, April. It's going to be on FXX, and it's going to be on, um, yes, soon. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. And I know it's soon. <laughs> and I should have this memorized because I know that me and my wanna friend say, are I want to say it's it. very close to uh, right after April Fool's. It's like April 6th-ish. Right after, think April's Fool's, think Archer. <laughs> I always, I, I can't help but think of that now. <laughs> and um, yeah, it'll be at 10 o'clock after uh, hopefully a good run of Simpsons episodes. So that's a perfect bookend for that. Thanks. I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that everybody really enjoys it. Like I, like I said, the main takeaway for me has been experiencing a different facet to these characters. They're all still the same characters that you love, but now they all have something new and different to play with. And I think that's fascinating. All right. Well, thanks so much, Matt. And we hope to see you again as multiple Emmy winner, Matt Thompson. Me too. Then I get to kill two people. And then, okay, no. <laughs> My golden so spires. Bye. See ya.